Today we're going to talk about Snell's Law. Snell's Law, easily derived using Huygens principle. We did it in class the what, Friday before break. We derived Snell's Law. So what we're going to look at Snell's Law now is looking at a very interesting historical perspective that gives you another way of finding Snell's Law. So we're going to review this. This is something that could show up on the test as far as the process and whatnot. It's not something that you're going to have a homework problem with because it's, it's kind of a curiosity of another way of proving Snell's law. So we start with the brachistochrone problem. It's a, what is that, Greek? And the words brachistos, the shortest, chronos is time. So it's the shortest time problem. Now there is one famous, I can't say the word to save my life, brachistochrone problem. And that is the one that in June 1969, Johann Bernoulli challenged mathematicians to consider a problem that Galileo had done incorrectly in 1638. And that problem is what path will take the shortest time in going from point A to point B. And Galileo had mistakenly said, oh, that should just be a circle. That's not going to look right. A piece of a circle. Okay, that's supposed to be a piece of a circle. That's what Galileo had said. And Johann Bernoulli had redone the calculation, realized that Galileo was incorrect, and he threw it out there as a challenge. Now, there was more to that challenge than, than what I said right here. I'll get to that on the next slide. So he sets this out and gets solutions from, among others, I say among others, I'm pretty sure there were more, Isaac Newton and his brother, and then Gottfried, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz, and William Francois Antoine Marquis de L'Hôpital. Any of those names familiar? Okay, L'Hôpital. L'Hôpital is famous, of course. We talked about L'Hôpital's rule. But L'Hôpital was one of the early formulators of calculus. Any other names up there that are interesting? Which one? Okay, Bernoulli. Now notice we had two Bernoullis already. Jacob, or Paul Jacob, and Johann Bernoulli. Um, these were very gifted scientists, and we have the Bernoulli relation that, honestly, I can't tell you which one it's from. So yes, famous names. What do you say? Of course, I was just a uh, okay. And of course, there's Sir Isaac Newton, very famous. Um, so these are some pretty big names. Now. Here's the thing. Who invented calculus? Isaac Newton is the answer that I get. Isaac Newton is probably the answer virtually every English speaker gives. The French speakers say that it was Gatry Wilhelm van Leeds. Now, what's the controversy? I reread, I, I read Wikipedia, I think it's gotten to the point where it's as good as Brit Encyclopedia Britannica. To make sure I got my bearings right, it, especially in hindsight, appears very clear that indeed Isaac Newton was the first one to the idea. Um, there appears to be some consensus that both of them did most of their work independently but there is a lot of question as to what Leibniz had. So some basic history. Um, um, Newton did not publish anything about his method of calculus until he published Principia Mathematica in what, 1687, um, something like that. He invented it, according to Newton, somewhere around 1666. I, I believe it was during the Black Plague when he was home, came up with his three laws, came up with universal law of gravitation, came up with calculus, or as he called it, his method of fluxions and fluence um, for solving 
problems that had continuous change. And he made a few tangential references to his new math in the successive years. And then after you know, a decade, Leibniz published about his version of calculus. And in L'Hopital's book that came out a few years after um, Newton's print, it, um, it, we just call it um, Principia. I can't remember the full name of it suddenly. I said it earlier, I think. Um, Principles of Physics, uh, some Physica or Principia or something like that. Um, but anyway, L'Hopital you know, said that virtually all of calculus was laid out by Newton in his book. Well, Leibniz claimed that he invented calculus. The, the Royal Society was sent a letter from Leibniz challenging Newton's claim of inventing calculus. The Royal Society never even interviewed Leibniz and issued their statement um, so, uh, that, that says, without a doubt, Newton is the one who invented calculus, but um, Leibniz is the one whose notation we use. So when you use that big S for a summation over a continuous um, distribution, what we call an integral sign, that's Leibniz. When you use the DDX, that's Leibniz. Um, but it was a few that went on and on. <laughs> Newton basically was trying to defend his good name as somebody who was intellectually honest. Leibniz, from what I was reading, most clearly was not intellectually honest. That is, he published um, he published things that were digging at Newton and alternative histories of Newton's work anonymously to try to you know, get people to see things his way. He denied it until there was proof that he had done it. Um, anyway, so there's some animosity between these two. And since Bernoulli was a friend of Leibniz, as was Lopetal, I believe, um, you know, French speakers and English speakers, this was um, the problem as it was laid out, actually used some verbiage, and I can't remember what it was, to tweak Newton to basically you know, say you know, that Newton probably wouldn't be able to do this or something like that. And so it was kind of like a challenge you know, that you would see on Facebook. Yeah. Can you do this or are you an idiot? If you ignore it, then you, know, you must have agreed that you were an idiot. And so Newton spent the night and sent a letter back the next morning with his solution, in which he included the notation that he did not appreciate being pestered by foreigners about mathematical problems. <laughs> so what is this problem? Well, the, the answer is a cycloid. And that solution, as you guys have all learned by now, you've learned that you can use calculus to find the maximum or minimum. And so what you do is you make an equation for the, uh, the time it takes to travel from point A to point B based on a path that has you know X and Y parameters. And then you want to minimize that variable or minimize the time equation. And so it comes out with this thing that's called the cycloid. And so if you had a ball that slid down the track on this path here, that would give you the fastest path if gravity and of course the force normal are the only things interesting. Look at what color my pin. Oh, it changed mid writing. How bizarre is that? Yeah, I just gave a review for Microsoft's OneNote and said it's a work in progress. That would be an example of why. So that path called the cycloid is the path that would take the least amount of time. It's, it's a shape that shows up in things like if you just take a string and, of course, the string is heavy enough that it doesn't just flap in the breeze. And, you know, this is not holding straight or a smooth shape because it's stiffer than it is heavy. But the shape that it takes will be that same shape as cycloid. Um, so it's, it's something that comes up in nature a fair amount. And that's the solution that was found using calculus.
So that's the brachistochrone problem. What we're going to look at is a different brachistochrone problem. Um, oh, yes, I cannot forget this. Alex will soon be taking a class where he uses Lagrangian mechanics. Lagrangian mechanics is based on the brachistochrone problem. It is, um, Euler came up with an equation that we call Euler's equation um, that allows you to, to find the relationship between variables in a fairly simplistic pattern. You make this thing that we call the Lagrangian, the L there. And the Lagrangian has, now it looks like three variables there, Q vector, Q vector dot and T. Q is a generalized position. It could be radius R. It could be angle theta. It could be other things. So those angle theta and radius R have different units. But it's a generalized unit for position. And then what, what does it mean when you put a dot over it? A dot product is when you put a dot between two vectors. That was a it's good game track. Better than saying nothing. In calculus class, you used primes. What did the prime mean? The, the prime meant a derivative. In physics, prime means derivative with respect to position. So prime is not just derivative. It's a specific derivative in physics. And dot is another specific derivative. Dot means derivative with respect to time. So none of you had the bat. Well, I think I talked about the first Tuesday of first semester. Kind of hard to expect you to have remembered that, right? But that's what this means. So we have, you know, for instance, if Q was R, then this would be R vector, R dot vector, and time. And you can have all kinds of parameters. You could have position and radius and, you know, seven different position variables. And you just have Q1, Q1 dot, Q2, Q2 dot, Q3, Q3 dot, and so on. So you make this equation, the Lagrangian, that is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then by Euler's work, Lagrange said, we can just take the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to, notice here I've used a subscript K because I could have lots of different Q variables. The partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to Q minus the exact derivative with respect to time of the partial derivative with respect to time of the Lagrange with respect to Q dot is equal to zero. It allows you to very quickly and usually easily get a set of equations to relate your generalized position and generalized acceleration. And so it allows you to solve a lot of problems that otherwise, at least as far as I know, would be pretty much unsolvable. So that's a grand application of the original Brachistochrone problem. Fermat's principle, now you guys have heard of Fermat? A whole lot of French names here, aren't there? What's Fermat famous for? His last theorem. Yeah, his last theorem. His last theorem is, well, something I don't know, but something that has been proven. His last theorem was a marginal note. He wrote in the margin of his notebook, I have found a simple proof that blah, 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 blah. And then he died. He never published what that proof was. And so everybody was all, what's the simple proof? What's the simple proof? And it wasn't until within the last decade that anybody is able to find a proof, much less a simple proof. I don't think that proof is all that simple. It's highly likely that Fermat was wrong, right? He made a mistake and it wasn't so simple. Um, anyway, so that's what he's famous for.
But Fermat's principle in January 1, 1662, which was before the famous Brachistochrome problem that we just spoke about, it was before the invention of calculus, I might add. Fermat proposed that light takes the path of least time to go from point A to point B. Now, the Brachistochrome problem was an object moving only under the force of gravity. What path is the fastest? This is light, not acting under the force of gravity here, just acting by what light does. We'll take the shortest path to go from point A to B, which can be inferred from Huygens' principle, right? We already determined Snell's law from Huygens' principle. That was the way we, we derived it. So now we're going to look at this and say, now that we have calculus, that we can minimize time in a reasonable fashion, let's see if Fermat was right. Spoiler alert, he was. So here's the problem. Fermat's principle Snell's law. You have point A that's listed here as P and point B that's listed here as P prime. So if we want to go from A to B, Fermat's principle says the path that you're going to take is going to be, that light will take, is the path of least time. Now, just to make sure we're all clear on the options here. If you have an object that's giving off light at point A, it's going to have light going like this, like this, like this, you know, all directions, right? And so conceivably, I could have light come like this and go like that, and that would go from point A to point B. But Fermat says the light that does this direction is not going to get to point B. The light that goes this direction is not going to get to point B. The light that goes this direction is not going to get to point B. And the one that gets to point B is going to be the one that takes the least possible time to go from A to B. So now we have to sit back and think about how we would do this. So the picture on the left is using the beach as a, an example of the thought process we go through. So let's say that Corso is a lifeguard at the beach. And so he's up there in his lifeguard tower, and he sees Alex out there struggling in the surf. <laughs> Very likely. So he's going to go rescue Alex, because that's what he gets the big bucks for. So the question is, what path should Corso take to rescue Alex? And we have there the cyan line that is the straight path, because the shortest distance between two points is... Straight, you said straight. What did you say? Displacement, isn't it? Isn't it? The displacement is, yes, that, that is a correct definition. What I was going for, the shortest uh, path between two points, the straight line. Yeah. So that's the shortest distance. But Corso can run fast. Corso swims a lot slower than he runs, unless you're some superhuman person. <laughs> So if he takes the path that's the shortest path, it's not going to be the shortest time because of his slow swimming compared to his speed at running. And so he can get there faster by running a little extra on the beach to make it a little shorter in the water. So another option that Corso could take, and, and you know what, this is the option that any lifeguard is going to take, would be to go until he's straight out and then swim the shortest possible distance. I mean, I never took life saving for the beach. I just took swimming pool. You know, I, my lifeguard was just the basic, but they always told us to, you know, go to the nearest point and then dive in to save the person. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you run around the pool if they're on the, you know, the nearest point that's accessible to you. So, we're trying to do the same thing now with light. So instead of going the direct path, we expect that if, if the light goes faster in one medium and slower in another, it's gonna go a, bit, a little bit farther in the faster medium and a little bit less distance in the slower medium. So do you understand the principle we're working with? 
want to make sure we understand the problem because if you don't understand the problem, well, then the solution is going to be lost. So what we need to do is define some random path. So we have a random path drawn here, the black line. And that random path is going to have a couple fixed parameters. That is, we have the distance from point A to the interface between the two media. The shortest distance there is listed as lowercase a. And the shortest distance from the interface to point B is lowercase b. And then we have the distance parallel to the interface between A and B is distance D. So those are fixed parameters. Fixed parameters based on where A is and where B is. If we're going to find the time for different paths, we're going to have to have a variable. What's that variable going to be? Well, it's going to have to have something to do with where he actually goes, if we're talking about the swimmer, where he goes from sand to water. And so that's where the variable x comes in. The variable x is going to be the distance from if he went straight to the water to where he actually is going to hit the water. So with those parameters, we now have a path that we can define and we can calculate the time. So let's start with the easiest thing. The time comes in two pieces, time one and time two. Time one is the time in the first medium. The first medium has speed one, index refraction one is equal to speed of light and vacuum over speed one. And of course, the second medium has speed two with index refraction two equals speed of light and vacuum over speed two. So based on speed, distance, time, how can you make a relationship for time based on speed and distance? Remember, I want to find, we talked about this earlier, but just to make sure you're transferring it for the brachistochrome problem, we need to find an equation for time and then minimize it. So that's why I'm looking for an equation for time. So go ahead. Distance over speed. So that's going to be, I'm just going to put distance one over speed one. Works, right? And what about time two? Yeah. Is, well, once Corso had the first one, it didn't take him but a second to do the second one. Those are all fine and good, except distance one and distance two are variables depending on what X is. So now I want to write distance one and distance two in terms of X. So if this is distance one, how do I find distance one for this little right triangle? Yeah, Pythagorean theorem. And what about distance two? Distance two is the hypotenuse here with, I guess I only need to put that, with B on one side and D minus X on the other. Okay, so distance two is that. So I can put these in for the time. Perfect. What shall I do? What shall I do? Well, here's, here's one option. Let's just go with total time 
is equal to T1 plus T2 is equal to square root of A squared plus X squared over V1 plus square root of B squared plus D minus X squared over V2. Now, this is not the fastest way, but it's the most obvious way, right? The, most, the fastest way is to make some substitutions right here and now that will save me time. Um, but we'll, we'll do it, the brute force, the way that you can see the development. So that's the time equation. What was the next step in the Brachistochrone problem? Once we found the time, what do we need to do? We need to minimize it. Mathematically, how do you minimize an equation? That's right. So time is a minimum when we take the derivative with respect to x and set that derivative equal to zero. That would be a minimum or a maximum. Of course, we're not interested in the maximum time. The maximum time is, well, it never gets there. So let's do that derivative. Ah, yes, my son is in calculus right now. He gets to do this all the time. How do you take the derivative of square root of a squared plus x squared? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you're right. You're right. Okay, I'm not, but just continue on. So you bring down the power. So we'll bring down the one half. And I'll, I'll put one over two V one because the V one was a constant. And then what? Okay, um, you bring down the power and then you have one less. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. I will do the way you said. I will do the way you said. So I'm going to rewrite T first as um, D minus X, not X minus D. Okay, so there's the rewriting the way you said. So then when we do the derivative, we bring down the power. So we bring down the one half. And then I put the V1 with it because it's a constant. And then we're going to have A squared plus X squared raised to what power? Negative one. Negative one half because we took one away from it. So it's, uh, okay, I see what you did. And then what's the last part? We have to use the, the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, which is going to be 2x. A is a constant, so it's just 2x. So that's the derivative of the first part. And then we're going to have the derivative of the second part, which will be plus 1 over 2v2 two two times b squared plus d minus x squared to the minus 1 half. Same rule. And then we now have to use the chain rule, and it's a little more complicated. 2 times d minus x. And then we have to do the derivative of the inside times minus 1. So we had to do the chain rule twice there. So now let's simplify this. Twos cancel. And this becomes equals 1 over V1 times X over square root of 
a squared plus x squared minus 1 over v2 times d minus x over square root. And that's equal to what? Zero, Zero if we're going to minimize it. So we have these are equal to each other. Well, this now is going to lead us right to our answer. Let's look back at our picture. We have x and square root a squared plus x squared. So if we have x, this side, divided by this side, this angle is theta 1, so this angle is theta 1. With respect to theta 1, what is x over d1? Sine. Sine. So I can replace this here. Now we look at the next one, d minus x over distance 2. So d minus x, that's this distance divided by this distance. And once again, here's theta 2. So what is d minus x over d2? Once again, it's going to be sine of theta 2. So now I am really, really close to done. There is only, there are only two steps left. Can you see the two steps to go from this to Snell's law? Okay, move one of them over. So I can move that over there. So I will have, I, I'm going to write it. That's right. Now I just multiply both sides by C. And C over V1 is N1. C over N V2 is N2. And we have just shown that Fermat was correct. That Snell's law, which is a simple or geometric derivation, shows that the light, the path the light takes is the path of shortest time to go from A to B. So now, once again, this could show up on the test as something for you to do, to process through. So make sure you can do this derivation. It wasn't a tough derivation. You had to find the time in terms of a variable, and I chose x because otherwise it would have had theta 1 and theta 2, two variables. So I chose x for that variable, made the equation for time as a function of x, took the derivative of time with respect to x and set to zero to solve for what x is going to be to make it the fastest. And it gave you an outcome. Any questions? Because uh, um, the steps, would it have been really hard to do the substitution before we did the uh, derivative? Um, well, if I'd done the substitution before the derivative, I would have had theta 1 and theta 2. And so then I have a multivariable function, and I'm trying to minimize it, and so I would have to then have a relationship. Yeah, it, it would have been really cool. All right. That's it for today.